one of my uh, one of my very first visceral, real experiences with with death was when my grandfather on my on my dad's side, my dad's dad, passed away my sophomore year in high school. Yes, I had known of my great grandparents who had passed away at that point. There had been community members within our town and our church that had died. I, I had been to funerals before. I had done all that. But this was the very first person that, that I truly genuinely loved, that, that, that I thought would be in my life forever. And then all of a sudden they weren't. And I didn't know how to process that. This was the first time I ever had to learn how to lose somebody. The first time I ever learned how to mourn somebody. And the first time I, I would just break down in uncontrollable tears over the fact that this person was no longer in my life. And he, he, wouldn't, be the, he wouldn't be the only person like that for me to lose, but, but he was the first. And, and it just stands in my memory and in my heart as, as such, a, such a challenging time for this, this young teenager. But I discovered something as, as I learned to lose him, as I learned to mourn him, I discovered how powerful memory can be. Oh man, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It, it's crazy when we're mourning some, somebody and, and we're just, <coughs> excuse me, uncontrollably just, just crying our eyes out, but all of a sudden the memory comes back into our hearts and, and we just can't help but get the biggest smile on our faces all at the same time. You know the, the feeling I'm talking about. I would remember when, when he was getting on his hands and knees with this, uh, me as a five-year-old playing in the sandbox at, at his cabin in Rio Doso and, and just playing tractors and trucks uh, with me. And, and years later, I remember him pretending to be a, a black bear in the woods, scaring my sister and I half to death uh, at that same cabin. I remember uh, visiting them in El Paso at their home in El Paso and, and him taking us to our backyard, his backyard, and, and showing off uh, the, the dozens of dozens of, of box turtles he had in his backyard and, and lovingly numbering the back of them with, with bright pink ladies nail polish so he would know how many he had. I, I remember him coming home from work um, from the oil refinery and, and always picking up Chico's Tacos in El Paso and, and feeding us uh, after work every single day when we would visit. I remember him coming to us, to our, to our home in, uh, near outside of Amarillo, Texas, and, and I remember every single family gathering that we would have where, where he would uh, lovingly uh, clean every single dish and every single piece of silverware, even though there was a perfectly good dishwasher right beside him. You know, I, all these wonderful memories just, just, just brought a smile to my face, and they still do. Memory can be such a powerful thing, can it? And that's what we discovered last week as we worshiped together online, isn't it? As we, as we dived into our first week of exploring communion, that the powerful memory of what, this, uh, of what this meal does in our lives, pointing our eyes back to that very real moment of Christ's death on the cross, that very real moment that assures us in our faith today that God can save us today because of the way he saved us in the past. Amen? That this, this meal has such a, a powerful memory component to us, to it, and we must never forget that. That, that at the, the very foundation of our faith is the historical reality that in a real place, in a real time, a real man named Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead. And this meal points our eyes to the past, to that very memory. And, and just like my memories of my grandfather, even more than my memories of my grandfather, the, the memory that this meal brings to mind sustains us through so many challenging times. But if this meal of Holy Communion is only a memory, if this meal only points your gaze to the past, if this is only a memorial to you, then church, you are missing out on so much. Yes, the, the past is enveloped in this meal. It is part of this meal, but it is so much more than that. And that's exactly what we discover today in, in Jesus talking about the, his body and his blood in the sixth chapter of John. Now, something crazy happens in the book of John when it comes to Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper. Unlike the first three Gospels, the first three biographies of Jesus that we have, Matthew, Mark, and Luke... Those three, in quite detailed fashion, explain to us the Last Supper. 
They, in a narrative form, they tell us about Jesus going to this upper room and celebrating this meal of bread and wine together and establishing and, and, and giving us a precedent on how we're supposed to worship today. That's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But did you know that there's a gospel that doesn't talk about the Lord's Supper at all? The Last Supper? It's the gospel of John. You won't see a, a story about Jesus gathering in the upper room in, in, in this gospel the way you do in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But does that mean that communion is nowhere to be found in John? Not at all. It, it's, it's, it's in there. Uh, surely it's in there. We saw that in the scripture reading today. But, but we don't get the traditional narrative of the Last Supper. Why is that? Why is that? Well, let's look at, at John chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 53, and, and we'll discover why John might be presenting communion to us in this new and fresh way. So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Again, this is John chapter 6. We're, we're quite possibly two, two to three years before the Last Supper actually happens in the upper room in Jerusalem. This, this is a long time. Months and months and months, if not years, before the Last Supper actually happens. Yet you can't read this passage with, without communion coming to your mind, can you? Jesus is talking about the body. He's talking about the bread. He's talking about the blood. He's talking about eating and drinking. Communion is written all over this passage, and the Last Supper hasn't even happened yet. Why is that? Why is John presenting communion in such a way? Well, I think part of the reason is John is trying to, to get at the very point that we're getting at today. That yes, communion, the Lord's Supper, is something that indeed happened in the past and points our gaze backwards. But it's also something that is totally woven throughout the entirety of Christ's ministry. The entirety of Christ's ministry is all about the body and the blood of Christ. It was, about, it was about Christ's ministry while he was walking with his apostles. It was about Christ's ministry as he was hanging on the cross. And it's about Christ's ministry today. Today, did you know that Christ is still doing ministry today? Sometimes I feel like we neglect that aspect of, of who Christ is. We, we talk a lot and, and devote ourselves a lot to, to, to the life and ministry of Christ while he was walking this earth. And we should. That is a good thing for us to do. But, but we should never neglect the, the truth that, that Christ is still in ministry right now, right here today. And even when he's talking about his body and his blood, it's all in present tense. Did you know that you can be quite the biblical scholar if you just pay attention to those lessons you learned in junior high and, and high school English class? You can learn a whole lot about God and, and his role in your life. If you just you know, hone in on some of the, some of the things you learned, like, like word usage and, and verb tense, you can discover so much about what God is trying to tell us. And what you see when you look at a passage like this is there is no past tense. There is nothing about what Jesus is saying, something that had happened in the past and only in the past. But it's all very present. This is happening right now. Right now. You will have no life in you. You will have eternal life. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. And then in the next section, starting in verse 56, this is completely present tense. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Not they will abide in me like only in the future, or they only abided with me in the past, but today, right here, right now, as we presently eat Christ's flesh, and as we presently drink Christ's blood, Christ abides in us presently today, and we abide in him presently today. What's that statement we say in, in the, the great communion prayer? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Present tense. Not Christ has died. Christ had risen. But Christ has died and Christ is risen. It's what we, it's what we learned last summer during our Ascension sermon series. That Christ is risen still today. And he sits on the throne of glory today. 
And by the power of his spirit, guess what? We sit beside him today. Christ is still very much so in ministry today. And that truth is revealed to us in an intimate way as we abide in him today. And he abides in us today as we drink of the cup and eat of the bread. Whenever somebody asks me what, what the Methodist church is, if, if they're not in church, or if they're not part of the Methodist church, you know, there's, there's a myriad of, of things I could say. But, but one of the things that always comes up in my heart is, is I like to explain to them that we are a sacramental church. And, and that's just a big fancy way of saying that we believe that we can experience the true reality of Christ in our lives right now. Amen. That we can experience that reality, not, in, not just in ordinary everyday events, but, but especially through the, the warm bath of communion and the hot meal of grace that we're served in the bread and the cup. That yes, this is a reminder of Christ's great deed on the cross 2,000 years ago, but it's also a present reality of Christ's love in our lives today, without question. You see, we shouldn't be burdening ourselves with, with that age-old question that, that Christians have asked for 2,000 years, what actually happens to the bread or what actually happens to the cup? That's not the mystery that, that God wants us to discover in this meal. The mystery of communion isn't what happens to the bread and to the cup. The mystery of communion is what happens to us when we eat and when we drink it right now. God, God isn't concerned with what's happening here. God is concerned with what's happening here. So how are we being transformed today in this meal? And it's precisely because we believe we can experience the present reality of Christ through this meal today is why we open this table to everybody. If, if we are told by Christ himself that all who drink of this cup and all who eat of this bread can experience his love and his grace, who are we to deny this cup and this bread to anyone? It doesn't matter if you're a member of our church or not. It doesn't matter if you're 99 years old or nine months old. We will serve this meal to you. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the language you speak, the, 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 what it says in your passport. It doesn't matter if you're a fugitive of the law. We're going to serve you communion and not turn you in. It doesn't matter if you're the most law-abiding citizen that there ever was. You still need this meal. Amen? We serve all. And you know, in the Methodist church, we also believe that even those who don't yet know Christ, if they hear a call from God on their life to come to this table, we serve them. We serve them. Because this meal might be the very way that their eyes are opened to the truth of Christ's presence in their life. And that's also why we're launching the new drive through ministry today. Because we want everybody who is able to, to eat this meal with us to come. We want everybody worshiping with us online. If you are in within driving distance of us today, you're hearing the sermon, you're going to pray over this meal with us in just a few moments, and we want you to come and we want you to eat this meal with us. God never hesitates to serve this meal to us. We should never hesitate to receive it. So if you're able to get in your car and come down here after worship, we would love to have you. And the same thing in the sanctuary. If, if you are willing to come to this table, if you are willing to, to eat of the elements that we pray over today, do it. Do it. Never hesitate. Never miss an opportunity to experience Christ's present reality in your life right here, right now. One of the most powerful personal witnesses I've ever seen throughout this meal was, was through my friend um, whose name is David a friend in Minnesota, and, and the first time I met David, he, he was a Muslim. And through a mutual friend in the church, um, he, he, in, he was invited to church, and, and he came one Sunday. And it just happened to be Communion Sunday at the church that I was serving at at the time. And, and in the back of my head and in, in, in my heart, I was praying throughout the whole service that, that David would come forward and that he would receive Communion. And, and the preaching was completed and, and the great thanksgiving was prayed and the invitation was made and, and the, the communion service got back to, to his pew and, and, I, and I looked wondering if he was going to stand up and come forward and he did. He came and, and I was blessed to be the one to serve him. 
So I broke the bread off and placed it in his hands, and I said, the body of Christ broken for you. And he dipped it into the cup, and he ate it. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw him stop at my left and spend some time in prayer before he went back to his seat. And it wasn't but a few weeks later that I was blessed to baptize him in that back same sanctuary that very month. Because he experienced the true reality of Jesus in his life through this meal. See, for David, there was very little past component to this meal. He didn't grow up in the church. He didn't know the Sunday school stories. He had very little past exposure to the faith to rely upon in this meal. For him, it was so much about the present reality of God's love and grace in his life. Oh, if every single one of us would come to this meal with the exact same expectation and hope that David did that day, wanting something new, wanting something fresh, wanting to be transformed because he knew that life could be better today than it was yesterday. If we would truly celebrate that Christ has died and Christ is risen, that we may know that more fully through this meal. An interesting thing happens when you only ever remember somebody. Yes, remembering my grandfather after he died was, was a great joy, and it, and it did bring some amount of, of solace to, to my teenage heart. But when you only ever remember somebody, loss keeps creeping back in, doesn't it? Yes, that memory does bring us great joy, but, but, but loss still seems to linger. Because when you're only remembering something, you can't help but be faced with the reality that you no longer have that anymore. That's not the case with this meal. This is not symbolic. This is not memory. This is not a memorial. This is the present reality of God in our lives right here, right now, today. So as you, as you receive this meal of love and grace today or in the future, for the 1,000th time or, or maybe for the first time, Yes, may your, may your gaze be directed to that past act of Christ on the cross and may you be humbled. But may you also, may you also discover Christ's present love for you and his promise that in eating of his body and of drinking of his blood, that he will abide in you and you will abide in him. Because Christ has died but Christ is also risen. Amen.